Trying to get your attention earlier, Lyle. I'm on. Um, good to see you all. Thank you all for choosing to come and to worship here this morning. I pray that as we worship together, you will sense and know God's presence in a very real way. As we grow closer together, as we grow closer to God, for those that are joining us online, welcome. We're glad to have you as well. We pray that it's a blessing to you. For our, our guests, anybody that's with us this morning for the first time, thank you for being here today. We hope that you're blessed and feel welcomed and loved, and we hope that you'll continue to join with us. Uh, if you would, please register your attendance. There's a perforated sheet in your bulletin. If you would please fill that out, tear it off, and put it in the offering plate, we would love to have a record of your attendance. It's also a great way to communicate prayer requests to us and other items of interest as well. Uh, there is no... I'm getting louder. There is no church council this Tuesday, September 27th. However, there is a charge conference that's going to be happening on Sunday, October 16th. So that's a few weeks away, but you might want to mark your calendars. If you're on the administrative council, please mark your calendars for that. And then notice that it's a cluster, and so it will be not just our charge conference. We will be having the charge conference with other churches, other charges as well. So it would be a great time for us to come together and hear what God's doing in other churches and also be able to share what God is doing here at Park Memorial and just to celebrate that. All that God is doing in the life of our church Praise be to God. 40 days of prayer continues. We had our first week at, uh, this past week. But we had two groups that meet on Sunday, uh, several groups that meet on Wednesday, one in the afternoon and several in the evening. If you didn't join or you're not part of a small group yet, it's not too late. You've only missed the first session. There's still lots of stuff to come. I'd rather have you come a little bit late than to not be there at all. So if you're not part of a small group, please let us know. We'd be happy to get you plugged into one of the existing small groups or maybe even start another small group. I wonder, is there anybody here who would be willing to share how your small group went, how you, you were in a small group this past week, either on a, either Sunday night or Wednesday? Anybody want, willing to share just what that meant to you or what you got out of it or what you thought about your small group Wednesday or Sunday? I know I'm putting you on the spot. I know I didn't pick anybody to do that. I just wondered. I just thought it went so wonderfully. I thought people would just want to share what God is doing and what God was doing in your group. Anybody? You don't have to. You get to. Naditra, yes. stand up so we can hear you. Thank you, Naditra. Praise God. Also, along with that, on Wednesday nights, anyway, Sunday nights we don't have a dinner per se, but Wednesday night we have our Wednesday night supper, and you'll notice there's an area for you to, to, to sign up for your, your Wednesday night supper. Um, and you don't have to be in a small group to come fellowship with us on Wednesday night supper. I think it would be great if we had some of our Sunday groups come and join us for fellowship on Wednesday evenings. That would be wonderful. So if you're in the choir or you just want to come and join us, you're not in a small group, you're welcome to come for that dinner as well. There's information about that coming up. And I'll tell you what, I was blown away at the, at the, at the dinner. Renee and Kathy and her team, fabulous job. Absolutely. Absolutely. Y'all missed out. If you missed that meal, you missed out. Uh, another thing I want to draw your attention to is our Church Connect page. Our Church Connect page has replaced our website. It's a way for us to put information out there. It's also a great interactive portal for you to engage with the church. There's a place that, that you can mark attendance for different events, even Sunday mornings. You can register for events such as our Wednesday supper. You can go in and uh, update and change your profile of what information is in there. You can even upload a picture. Uh, you can give. There's a link for giving online on that Connect page. Uh, and I want to encourage you to, to consider that, giving online. It's an act of worship just as it is an act of worship here. Uh, and, and if you decide to do that, there are several ways you can give online. You can give, um, you can give I haven't even started preaching yet. Um, she's yawning. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> 
So you can give online, you can use a credit card or a debit card, or you can, give a, uh, you can make a uh, direct transaction right from your bank account. And I would encourage you to do that if, if you do it. You can do it any way you want to, but if you give via your uh, ACH out of your checking account or your savings account, then the charge is less for the church. So just consider that if you're going to give online. And also please note that the PALS, um, their dinner, their, their We Piddle Around Theater trip has changed from November the 4th to November the 11th. So if you were planning on going on that, please make note of that, and I hope you'll still plan on going and joining them. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? All right. It's so good to see you this morning. Let's praise God and worship together. Our greeting can be found in the bulletin. If you would, read along with me. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And please stand as we sing and turn in your hymnals to page 131. We gather together. remain standing as we continue to worship our affirmation of faith this morning is going to be number 884 in your hymnal if you want to take a moment and turn there
And let us join together in affirming our faith. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments, as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who are united in the living Lord, for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God, as the divine will realized in human society, and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. And if you would, please turn in the back of your bulletin or uh, to that page right next to where you tore out your connection card, and that is where our prayer list is located. And if you would, I'd like it if you would to add a couple of folks. If you would add John Dew, John and Linda Dew, who usually come to the 830 service, and they were unable to be with us this morning. John's having some issues with his kidney, is that correct? So if you would, please add John Dew to the list. Also, if you would, add Klein... Flowers, K-L-I-N-E, Klein Flowers. Klein is Ray Kaiser's uncle, and, uh, and he's, having, he's having some lung issues, and he has been uh, admitted to ICU. So please add Klein to the list. And I know she's already on the list. Uh, Aminette, oh, excuse me, John, Klein Flowers is Wayne, Cindy and Wayne Mitchell. That's Wayne Mitchell's uncle, I'm sorry. Not, not Ray Kaiser's. And then Almanette Kaiser is Ray's mother. She fell and broke a rib. So please, I know she's on the list, but let's remember healing for her as well. Any others that need to be added this morning? Any praises? Anybody want to have a praise they want to share? Any updates on anybody on the list? Okay. All right. Let's go to God together. Well, gracious and almighty God, Good, good Father, Lord, we come this morning seeking you, seeking your presence, seeking your peace, seeking your power this morning, Lord, and we ask, God, that you would condescend to be with us today as we worship you. Father, we worship you and adore you this morning. We're so thankful this morning to be allowed to gather as the people of God. We're so thankful, Lord, to be able to worship in this manner and God, we are so thankful this morning for your son, Jesus, who died for us on the cross, Lord, that we might have eternal hope of salvation, that we might enjoy eternal joy with you in heaven. Father, we pray that you would hear our prayers this morning. As we lift them up to you this morning, God, we pray that you would be with those, those decisions that we have to make in this next week. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us in the decisions we made last week and we're not sure about. We pray, God, that you would be with those things that, were, that are ahead of us, Lord, that cause us great anxiety. Lord, those things that cause us to, to toss and turn at night, to, to wring our hands and to be concerned about. Lord, give us peace to know, God, that you have it all in your hands. And Father, we pray for those daily things, God, those things that we come across every single day that we don't recognize you, that we don't realize, God, that you're in it. Father, we pray for those and we thank you for being in each and every one of those moments. Lord, hear our prayers.
this morning. And hear the prayers of those that we lift up to your throne of grace. For those in need of healing this morning, we lift up Bubba, Adams, Gary Barr, Gilda Belcher's mother, Terry Blankenship, Mona Burdick, Charlie Calder, Catherine Craig, Penny Dees, John Dew, Llewellyn Dunn, Klein Flowers, Kenneth Grantham, Wade Griggs, William Griswold, Felicia Hardy, Susan Haug, Bill Henderson, Max Hughes, Wade Jones, Don Jordan, Jim Knight, Raymond Kaiser, Ed Kutch, Gail Stimson Lopez, Megan Mathy, Dr. Jean Omasta, Jackie Pineda, Shea Prather, Renita Richburg, Denise Smith, Sally Sonnenberg, Mark Steed, Vance Ventress, Dwayne Webb, Arnold White, Molly White, Charles Wilson, and Charlie Mae Wilson. Father, thank you that you are a God of healing, and we pray your healing grace on each of these names that we have lifted up to you. Be with those, O oh Lord God, that are homebound today and unable to be with us physically. We pray for Bob and Betty, for Rosemary, for Carolyn and Ronnie, for Nell, for Michelle, for Aminette, and Lord, we pray your healing touch for Aminette, for her rib as well. We pray for Vera and Scott. We ask God that you be with Lee Armstrong, Joan Brooks and her family, the Little family, Griffin McCrary. We pray, O oh God, for our nation. We pray, Father, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon our nation. God, that you would revive us, O oh Lord God, that you would breathe into us a spirit of revival. Lord, that we as a nation would turn our hearts back to you. God, that you would be glorified in this nation. And God, that we would hear your word, that we would follow you as King of Kings. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our church. Help us, O oh Lord God, to rise up and to be the church. Give your church a voice, Lord, to speak. Not about things that we're against, but things that we're for. Not about anger and hatred, but Lord, about love and compassion. About grace, your grace, Lord God, that you have for us as a nation and each of us as individuals. We pray, Lord, for the United Methodist Church. Lord, all the things that are happening in, in the United Methodist Church, we pray your will be done. We pray, God, that you would lead and guide and direct the leaders in the various factions of the, of the United Methodist Church. We pray, God, that you would be with us here at Park Memorial as we make decisions about what you are calling us to do, where you are leading us. We pray for your wisdom, for your spirit. We pray for peace for the nation of Israel. We pray that you'd be with the nation of Ukraine, Lord, as they continue in this bloody, bloody war. We pray, God, that you would bring sense to the nations involved. We pray, God, that you would, you would move in the hearts of the leaders, especially in the Russian leaders, Lord, that, that you would bring wisdom, that you'd bring discernment, that you'd bring clarity, Lord, that you'd bring peace. Father, we pray that you would bring peace, and we pray that you would be with them, Father, as they continue to restore their lives. We ask, God, that you would enter in to their lives, that you'd enter into the lives of those who suffer today as disaster victims from from floods to fires to tornadoes to earthquakes, Lord, here and around the world, we pray, God, that you would mend back together those, Lord, that have been rent apart. Lord, that you would help to restore and rebuild, that you would renew because you are a God of renewal. We pray for the 40 days of prayer. We pray, Lord, that we, it would not be just a campaign. Lord, it would not just be a Bible study. It would not just be something that we go through, Lord, and say, okay, we've done that and put the check in the block. Lord, we pray for a, a powerful outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We pray, God, for a move of your Spirit in our lives individually and our life as a church corporately. Lord, do something amazing in us through this 40 days of prayer. Show yourself to be the awesome God that you are. And Father, we pray for those men and women who serve in law enforcement and in the military. We're so thankful for their service. And we pray, Lord, especially for Matt Calder, Will Chance, Nate and Parker Dukes, Gage Garrett, Nick Gruber, Reed Johnson, Dalton Jordan, Josh Joseph, Michael Key, George King, Blair and Justin Lunsford, Carmen Mitchell, Eric Parnell, Kenny Pinkard, Madeline Kate Puckett, Clay Rhodes, Barry Rogers, Isis Torellis, Garrett Tucker, and Amanda Wall. Father, be with all of these names as we lift them up to you in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us as his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. seated and would our ushers please come forward as we continue to worship through the giving of God's tithes and our offering. And would you pray with me? Father all that we have is from you. You are a good good father. You are a loving God and you break open the dams of heaven and you pour out unto us blessing upon blessing upon blessing. As an act of worship and love, we give back to you a portion of all that you have given to us. And we ask, O oh God, that this would be used, that the word of God, the message of love, would make its way everywhere around the world, that every heart would be touched by the love of Christ. Would you bless the gift and the giver this morning as we give it in Jesus' name. Amen.
would you please be seated, seated as our children are dismissed for Children's Church. Choir steps down if y'all would like to find Luke 11, 11 through 13 in your Bible. We want to read. All right, if you would, please stand. Ready? 
this is Luke 11, 11 through 13. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, Holy Spirit, come and speak to your people today. Speak to those, Lord, who are far off. Speak to those, Lord, who are close. Speak to those who need it the most. And, Lord, I pray that you would speak to the one who thinks they don't need it at all. Father, speak to us now your words of life and love and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're continuing in our 40 Days of Prayer campaign. Two weeks ago, we talked about why we're doing this campaign. And last week, we looked at some of the misconceptions about prayer and the fundamentals of prayer. And if you missed either of those messages, I want to encourage you to go onto our Facebook page and to watch them. They're the foundation that we're building on, and you don't want to miss any of these messages. Not because Brian Dovey is such a great preacher, but because this is such an important life-changing topic. Today we're going to look at how we look at God. A.W. Tozer wrote, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you because it affects everything else in your life. Your understanding of who God is shapes everything else in your life, including your prayers. Who we are and what we become cannot be separated from our understanding of God. Nothing influences your life more than how you view God. Some view God as this grumpy old God who's just angry all the time and never wants to listen to you and never wants to hear what you have to say. You can do nothing to please him. Some people have a vengeful God who's just waiting to stomp on you every time you get out of line. Some people have the flaky father God who's moody and always changes his mind about everything. Some people think of God as the cosmic cop, that God's just here to make sure everybody follows the rules. Or the Santa Claus God, where he makes a list and checks it twice to find out who's naughty and find out who's nice. Some people have what Rick Warren calls the Play-Doh God, where you can make him into anything you want. Some people like to say things, I like to think of God as blank. I like to think of God as this, or I like to think of God as that. Well, I'm sorry. It doesn't really matter what you like to think about God. When it comes to God, it's what he's really like that's important, not what you like to think about him. It's important that we know the real God. There are many characteristics about God or, or that God has, but this morning, I want us to look at the goodness of God. Because if God's not a good God, there's no reason for you to pray. The only reason there's any good in the world is because God is good. God is good. If there's no God, there is no good. If there is no God, there is no right, there is no wrong. Because God is always good, there are five things that we can know about prayer. And I want you to understand these five things because when you understand how good God really is, you're going to enjoy prayer a whole lot more. Prayer is not a duty, prayer is a delight. Let's look at five implications of the goodness of God in your life and how that's going to change the way you pray. Number one, God's plans for my life will always be good. God's plans for my life will always be good because God is always good. Jeremiah 29, 11, and 12. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Do you see the connection? Do you see the connection between God's purpose and our prayers? God has never made anything without a purpose, and God put a whole lot of thought into creating you. God's plans for your life are revealed and realized through prayer. The more you pray, the more you're going to understand God's plans for you. 
David said in Psalm 31, 19, how abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you. God has things stored up for you in heaven. God has things that he wants to bless you with right now. That's why we're doing 40 days of prayer. I want God to bless you. I don't want you to miss these blessings. They're not automatic. They don't automatically happen. They happen when we pray. It's prayer that opens God's storehouses of blessing. James 1.17 says this, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadow. God didn't promise that everything that happens in your life will be good. He says, I have good plans for you. Church, we live in a broken world that's broken because of sin. But God says, even in the middle of all this brokenness, I have a plan for your life. And he says, even when you make bad choices, I'm greater than those choices. Aren't you glad this morning? I'm so glad that God is greater than the bad choices that I've made. God can redeem our mess-ups. God can redeem those dumb things that we do. Amen? What a God. What a God who can turn crucifixion into resurrection. Romans 8, 28 reminds us, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. A lot of people like to stop at the first part of that. A lot of people like to say, oh, God works all things for the good. No, 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 you got to read the whole scripture. God works all things for the good of who? Of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Things aren't working together for good for everybody in the world. Everything isn't working together for good for those who don't know God. Everything only works together for the good of those who say, God, I want you. I want more of you. God, I want your plan in my life. God, I want your purpose in my life. It doesn't say all things are good. It says that in all things, God works for the good, even the bad, even the bitter. There's a story in the Bible about a guy, maybe you've heard of him, named Joseph, whose brothers sold him into slavery, only to have him wind up to rise up to be the second highest leader in the, in the land of Egypt. And years later, his brothers came to him. He confronts them, and he says in Genesis 50, verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. That's called redemptive suffering. Sometimes we suffer for other people's benefits. That's what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross. Jesus didn't pay for his sins. Jesus didn't have any. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and my sin. And sometimes, like in Joseph's case, God takes the bitter and uses it to make the world better. And he makes the world better because of what you went through sometimes. God says, it's not all good in your life, but I can use it all for good. I can fit it into the plan, even the hurts, even the pain, even the sins of other people who have hurt you. I can use it all. God is a good God, and he loves to bring good out of bad. You know, anybody can bring good out of good, but our God brings good out of bad, amen? In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, it tells us that for his people who grieve, God bestows a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. Praise God. That's the first thing we learn. God's plan for my life will always be good because God is always good. He doesn't have bad plans for your life. Number two, the second pillar of God's goodness. Because God is always good, God always gives me what I need, not what I deserve. I'm so thankful this morning that I don't get what I deserve. You ought to be too. Because if we got what we deserve, none of us would be sitting here this morning. We're here only this, this morning because of the goodness and the grace of God. Psalm 103 verse 10 says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or pay us according to our iniquities. Why? Why is that? For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Y'all, that is good news this morning. King David, a man that the Bible says was a man after God's own heart, committed adultery. And then to cover up his sin of adultery, he had the husband of the woman murdered. He was an adulterer and a murderer. Pretty serious sins, don't you think? That ranks right up there. 
But David knew that he didn't deserve to be forgiven. David didn't deserve mercy, but he knew that God was a good God. And so he asks for mercy. Here's what he prays. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Not because I deserve it, but because you're a good God, because of your unfailing love, because of your compassion. Let me make this real, real clear to you this morning. God doesn't forgive you because you're good. He forgives you because he's good. When you seek mercy and grace, he doesn't reject you. Psalm 27.10 says, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Because God is always good and God is always gracious, when we pray, we can always be bold. We can always be confident when we pray before God. We don't have to come slinking in with our tail between our legs, afraid of what's going to happen. We can have boldness and confidence because of Christ. Hebrews 4.16 says this, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Y'all, that is talking about prayer. That's how we come to God in prayer. God always gives me what I need, not what I deserve. So when I need forgiveness, he doesn't give me judgment because of what Jesus did on the cross. Now here's the third factor for, for God's goodness. Because God is always good, God thinks of me above himself. That's the heart of the gospel. That's the good news, that the king sacrifices himself for the peasant. This is what makes our faith different from every other religion in the world. God says, you've sinned, you deserve death, you deserve punishment, but I'm a good God, and I love you. But I'm also holy, and I can't let go sin unpunished. So here's the deal. I'll do it. I'll pay the price. I'll pay the debt that you owe. This is the ultimate expression of love. The shepherd dies for the sheep. Look at what Jesus says in John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He says it again in verse 15 of that same chapter. I lay down my life for the sheep. Really? That's unbelievable to imagine that God, perfect God, died for imperfect me, imperfect you. Y'all, that is amazing. And here's the mind-blowing thing. Not only did Jesus pay for our sin like that's not enough, he also imputes his goodness. Through our faith in Christ, the righteousness of Christ is given to us. That's called imputed. Imputed righteousness means when something's imputed, it's, it's ascribed, it's given to somebody else. When we place our faith in Christ, God ascribes the perfect righteousness of Christ to our account. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5.21 puts it like this. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Not only is Christ's righteousness imputed to us, our sin is imputed to him. Jesus takes, every, takes the guilt of every rape, of every murder, every gossip, every lie, every, every molestation, every evil, every tax evasion, everything done throughout history, Christ takes it upon himself. Paul says in Romans 4.25, Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins. That's Good Friday. And was raised to life. That's Easter. For our justification. To be justified is to be made right, just as if I'd never sinned. If you're a believer this morning, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. If you're a believer this morning, when God looks at you, he sees Christ. He sees Christ whenever he looks at you. Now, what in the world does what I've talked about for the last five minutes have to do with prayer? It has everything to do with prayer. And if you don't understand what I just talked about, you'll never understand prayer. What God did for you and me makes prayer possible. Look at Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us 
all things. If God loves you enough to give his only son for you, don't you think he loves you enough to help you out with your finances? Don't you think he loves you enough to help you out with your health and your relationships? If he loves you enough to die for you, don't you think he loves you enough to answer your prayers? All right, number four, the fourth truth. Because God is always good, he does not say yes to every request. Now, every parent in here knows that no loving parent would ever grant a child everything they, everything they request, right? God will never give you something that's not good for you. Last week, I told you that God always answers every single prayer. Not always the way you want, but he answers every single prayer. God answers every single prayer in one of four ways. When the request isn't right, God says no. Good parents say no to their kids a hundred times a day, right? Good parents say no to their kids all the time. Listen, God doesn't owe you an explanation for why he says no. You simply need to trust him. You need to trust that God knows best. When the timing isn't right, God says, not yet. Let's go slow. There's a big difference between a delay and a denial. No is not the same thing as not yet. In fact, if you don't understand that, that means that you're immature. Because children don't understand that. Children don't understand. When you say not yet to a little child, what do they hear? They hear no. And they throw a fit, right? Because you just told them no, they couldn't have what they wanted. Sometimes the request is right and the timing's okay, but you're not right. You're not ready. God has something to give to you that you need to grow in order to receive. You're not ready to handle the answer because it's often bigger than you're ready to handle. God wants to give you something, but he's waiting for you to grow. Now, when the request is right and the timing's right and you're right, he says, go. He gives you the green light. He says, go. I'm going to give you what you want. God may say no or let's take it slow or you need to grow. And we all love this one. He says, go. Right? That's one of, one of four ways. And every one of those four answers is a legitimate answer to prayer. In our scripture for today, Jesus says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. See, the, the point Jesus is making here is that God's never going to give you anything that's going to hurt you. God's never going to give you anything that's bad for you. But he's saying that you, as an imperfect human being, know how to give good gifts to children, to your kids. How much more his being a perfect, good father are his gifts, if you ask. Sometimes we ask for things and we don't really understand what it is we're asking for. There was, a, there was a mother of two of Jesus' disciples, James and John. And, and one day this mother came to Jesus and said, Grant that one of my two sons may sit on your right hand and the other sit on your left hand when you come into your kingdom. And this is what Jesus said to her in Matthew 20, verse 22. You don't know what you're asking for. In other words, you, you've got a limited perspective. You, you don't see the big picture. You don't really understand the depth of the question you're asking. And that's true for us. We don't have a real perspective. We don't have the, a picture. of the, We don't have the big picture. We don't realize what we're asking for. And we need to trust that God knows what's best. We need to trust what he's doing. And we need to know that he's good. Now, let's just be honest for a minute. It's really easy to trust God's goodness when everything's going our way, isn't it? It's really easy to trust God's goodness when things are happening right, things are going well, we're, we're happy. The test is, can you say that God is good when everything's falling apart? When things aren't working out? When you're not seeing the changes, changes when you're not getting the answers you're looking for, when you're, when you're in the dark, when you're alone and you're afraid, can you then say that God is good? That's the test of your faith. And God is going to test your faith thousands of times in your life. Do you trust your feelings? It's easy to feel good when everything is going well. Or are you going to trust your faith that God is good even when I can't see it, even when I can't see what's happening? See, the test of your faith is not how high you jump or how loud you sing praises when everything is going well. The test of your faith is how straight you walk 
when everything is falling apart? Is God a good father when your children are sick? Is God a good father when you've lost your job? Is God a good father when someone you love has died? That's when you find out if you trust God or not. Most of you probably don't know that Lynn and I had a daughter named Eve. She was our oldest. And she was murdered by her boyfriend when she was 19 years old. That was devastating. It changed our, changed our world forever. I couldn't understand why. I still don't know why. Why a good God allowed that to happen. Why didn't God answer my prayers? I prayed for my children every day for safety. And he didn't protect her. And I had a decision to make as I struggled with that. I could either be angry and bitter and turn away from God because I didn't understand or I could run to God and love him and trust him even though I couldn't understand why. And that's what I chose to do. That's what I choose to do every day. Not everything that happens in the world is good. Not everything that happens in the world is God's will. Not everything that happens in the world is God's will. God is sovereign. God will accomplish his will. But God has given you and me a tremendous gift called free will. God's not going to force you to do something. God's not going to force you or anybody else to love him. And because of that, that tremendous gift is also a tremendous curse. Because it can be painful. The test of your faith is when you can say like Job, when you've lost everything, all your family, all your crops, all your business, all your health, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. You know, a lot of times when you pray for stuff, it doesn't happen. God doesn't always answer prayer the way I ask. Does that mean the prayer doesn't work? Of course not. Of course it works. I've seen it work too many times to believe otherwise. That's why I ask every Sunday morning and, and other times when we gather, that's why I ask you to share a testimony. Share what God is doing in your life because there's somebody who's not, there's prayers not being answered and they need to see that God is alive, that God's at work. And so sometimes you can share, this is what God did for me and that encourages somebody who's praying to continue to pray, to continue to seek God because prayer works does it mean that God isn't good? No, God is good whether I'm in pain or not. Does it mean that God doesn't care? Of course God cares. Does it mean that I should give up prayer because I don't get everything I ask every time? No. God's not a vending machine. He's not, he don't go and put something in the slot and get something out in return. God's not a cosmic Santa. God has not guaranteed you a pain-free life. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you won't have trouble as a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does God say prayer will make every single moment in your life easy. It's not God's job to make every moment in your life easy. If he did, we'd never grow up. We'd continue to be children. My job is to keep praying. My job is to keep trusting God with the answer because I know that everything he does and everything he allows in my life, he will use for good. And so I accept a no, or a slow, or a grow. And we all love this one, a go. I've had a lot of pain in my life. In fact, almost everything I've learned in life, I've learned through pain. The, the greatest lessons I've learned, anybody have a testimony? Anybody say amen? The greatest lessons you've learned in life have been the hard ones? the difficult ones, the painful ones. I've, I haven't learned a whole lot from pleasure. I haven't learned a whole lot from success, but I've learned a ton through pain. And God is more interested in making me a man of God than he is in making me comfortable. And God is more interested in making you a man or woman of God than he is in making you feel comfortable. You don't know God is all you need until God is all you have. And then you realize God does everything for good. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Which is why he doesn't answer every prayer the way I ask. We're praying at one level, and God's at a completely different level. Number five, last one. Because God is always good, he invites us to live with him forever. God is going to show you his goodness forever and forever. God's going to show you his goodness for eternity. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Even when you're in pain, no matter how much pain you're in, some of you may be in tremendous pain today. You may be going through a very difficult trial today. No matter how deep or hard or your, prayer, your pain is, it will eventually end. But heaven's forever. Heaven's forever. Amen? The joy that we'll experience is forever. The hope that we'll experience is forever. That's God's plan. That's God's promise. That's God's purpose. The very last verse of Psalm 23 says this. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. That's good news. That's wonderful. We could stop right there. But he doesn't. He goes on to say, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's our hope. That's the plan that God has for you. Until you're absolutely convinced that God is a good God and that God, that he's always good and that he never does bad in your life, your prayers are going to be powerless and passionless. On the other hand, when you realize, when you, get, when you get it, no matter how I feel, no matter what circumstances look like, God is for me, he's not against me. God is a good God, and he wants what's good for me. God is a good God, and that's the foundation of all your prayers. If that's the foundation of your prayers, your prayers are going to be powerful and passionate. God's going to be moved by those kind of prayers. So let me ask you this. What do you want to see happen in your life? during these 40 days of, of prayer. What is it that you're going to commit to? I want you to commit to learning how to pray, and it starts with the goodness of God. Nothing is more important in your life than learning how to pray effectively. It's the way that we tap into God's power. We tap into God's presence. We tap into God's peace. We tap into God's purpose. We tap into God's plan for our lives. Listen, Satan's not afraid of your plans. He's not afraid of your little schemes. He's not afraid of your budget. He's not afraid of your programs. But I guarantee he's afraid every time you get on your knees and pray. He's afraid of your prayers. Because when, you, when God's people begin to pray, the Satan knows that we're tapping into the power of God and something amazing is going to happen. So get ready. Hold on for the ride of your life. Get ready for God to do something amazing in your life and in our church. Things happen when people start praying. Last thing, and then I'll close. I want you to pray these last two verses this week, and I put them in your outline. Psalm 119, verse 37. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. You might want to put that on your television screen or your computer monitor. And Lamentations 521, restore to us, restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return. As we sing our closing hymn this morning, the altar is open, as it is every Sunday, for you to come and respond to whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today. God's here, and God's calling you. He's speaking to you this morning. If you haven't given your life to Christ, come to him today. Seek his forgiveness and his goodness. And if you have come to know Christ today, come and seek his power, seek his presence to help you live out the plan and the purpose God has for you. Let's stand together and sing. To page 452, my faith looks up to thee.
receive the benediction. Go forth today with the God of love and peace and grace. May you know his plan and his purpose for you. And may you know his power. Go in the love and grace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.